So good afternoon. My name is Nadine Hani. I present the business news on Al Arabiya News Channel, and it is my pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for joining us, and welcome to this session, which will discuss the next media revolution. As the theme indicates, we will try over the next 45 minutes to discuss the dramatic disruption that the media industry is experiencing on many fronts in the way it creates content, distributes content to consumers, and monetizes audiences. As an illustration to this disruption, just think of how many times you have checked your timelines right now while we were going up on stage. Whether it's on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, or any other platform. And were you just checking the posts of traditional media outlets such as Al Arabiya or CNN or Bloomberg or other organizations? Or were you also checking the posts of individuals with a great following who post interesting pieces of news or opinions? Patterns of consuming news have changed, and individuals, which are called influencers and citizen journalists, are competing these days with traditional media on two levels, whether it's on content generation or on revenue. In a recent Reuters survey, 51% of respondents said that they use social media as a source of news each week. 12% said it is their main source. Facebook was by far the most important network for finding, reading, watching, and sharing news. And here's an interesting finding. Around 8% of smartphone users said that they currently use an ad blocker. Around a third of them said they plan to install one on their mobile in the, in the next year after they asked them that question. So think of what that does to the revenue, to the advertising revenue. The traditional curators of news are under pressure as never before. They have to invest for the new generation of news consumers who want customized content that is meaningful to them, that they are able to share with their friends and can interact with. Those media corporations have to generate high quality content, which means they incur a high cost, yet they have to distribute it among multiple platforms, which fragments the offering and hence the revenue. So how do all these trends affect the media industry? Are we on the edge of another media revolution? What will tomorrow's media look like? Who will it serve, and how will it shape the future? To discuss this topic, we have with us an esteemed panel of speakers. I will introduce them in the order in which they are seated. Uh, we have with us Her Excellency, Mrs. Noura bint Mohammed Al Kabi, UAE Minister of State for Federal National Council Affairs and Chairwoman of the Abu Dhabi Media Zone Authority and 2454. Her Excellency, Mrs. Mona Ghanem Al Marri, Director General of the Dubai Government's Media Office. Dr. Claire Wardle, Research Director at the Tao Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia University, and Mr. Aaron Sherinian, Chief Communications and Marketing Officer for the UN Foundation. Aaron, ladies first, of course, so we're gonna start with the ladies. So thank you all for, for being with us. Uh, Your Excellency, Mrs. El Kabi, I would like to start with the topic, the main theme of our discussion. Are we on the edge of a new media revolution? And if yes, why do you think so? I think, I mean, I mean, answering your question of the new media revolution and how media is evolving, and let's say how content is, is, the platform is changing, and the way that we consume media is changing as well. Uh, there is a shift in terms of um, how the media looks like and how we consume the media. Um, maybe 10 years ago or more than that, we, we tend to have different behaviors in terms of what we would read in the morning uh, and how we would summarize our news. Currently, uh, at the end of the day or the beginning of the day, if you're on Twitter, of course, the newspaper is sitting on the desk, that's it, so a print goes to waste. Um, then you're also living in a very globalized, interconnected world where you want to know what's happening from different uh, views, you know, the style of analyzing news is different, and also the style of us consuming that news. With, with the fastest pace, we want to check visuals, infographics, quick summaries. Currently, I've been consuming, uh, I've been reading my news uh, uh, on, a, on an app called Quartz. Why do I do that? It's still, it's very um, tailored to the American market, but it just gives me a, a headline and then asks me, do I want to know more about it? And then I say yes, with an emoji. Um, and there's a summary. And a, a summary that save, saves maybe a minute or two minutes of my time reading the whole article. And if I wanted to read the whole article, I can go and read it. So I feel that what's happening, there's, 
you know, a shift, a change on content and how it's displayed and how it's being, uh, how it's being disseminated. And therefore, us as consumers also, there's a, a change in the behavior. And I think both of them, they should also, I mean, the, the content creators, I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're the ones who are, um, should be innovative in a way uh, to think of how are we going to disseminate our content. There are challenges at many, many fronts, but um, let us continue with the, with the main thought, which is, are we, uh, are we on the edge of a revolution? Uh, what is it that the consumer wants, uh, uh, Your Excellency, Mrs. Lemari, today, uh, th things, consuming patterns are changing, uh, but how will that uh, evolve, and do you think that the, the term revolution will happen uh, in the media sector? It's already happening, I think. Uh, news, it's not only uh, you know, uh, being consumed 24 hours a day. It is consumed uh, in our mobiles uh, and other multiple platforms. I think uh, consumers today, they receive, media consumers, they receive the content that they want easily through social media and other platforms. So social media has become 63% of Facebook and Twitter users say that they, they really uh, reach their content uh, through their social media platforms. I think social media will play an important role in the future and it will change dramatically the scene of media industry, especially the media outlets that has to really cope with the change that is happening. This revolution has started long time ago, but maybe talking about this region, yes, we've noticed the change recently, but all our media outlets should really, you know, follow this uh, trend and really make it happen to their, to develop their, uh, the industry, the way that they see it, it will happen. I think um, consumers also look for a trustful uh, source of information, a credible one. And, uh, and media, whether it's a media outlet or even a blogger or an influencer, whatever it is, it is a credible outsource that they believe in. It has credibility and authority. So today you can reach, and you, uh, in, recent, in recent years we, we've seen uh, a tremendous change. I mean, we, we easily find uh, and view and share content, you know, so content is easily shared with everyone. You don't need that uh, accuracy, but still, I think, uh, accuracy, accountability, and responsibility is something that we should invest and focus on in the future of the media industry. This takes us basically to the idea of journalism and because uh, credibility goes hand in hand with journalism and we will be discussing a bit later whether uh, this, how much of a challenge this poses to the, uh, the j career as a journalist uh, and to the journalism industry. Uh, but before that, uh, Dr. Clare, definitely the pattern of, consum of consuming news has changed. But what are the other trends that you see in the media industry that you think will shape this coming revolution if you agree that a revolution is happening in the media sector? I mean, I think the biggest concern is that the levels of the numbers of news organizations that exist today cannot be sustained. So I think if we look into the future, quite soon we're going to have a significant drop in the number of news organizations. And you can say, I was at the Democratic National Convention in the summer and I sat with the press and there were 700 laptops in front of me, all writing up the same speech, slightly different headlines, but the same speech. And because we have this infinite amount of white space on the internet, people say, well, we create content, you can advertise against that content. But again, if you think about the Olympics, I would receive six notifications on my phone telling me that Michael Phelps had won another gold medal. I'm not going to subscribe to six different news organizations telling me the same news. And my concern is that that's going to move us into a world where we have fewer distinct news organizations and an increased reliance on those centralized corporations of Facebook and Google to be the places that give us our information. And I am very worried about that centralization. But I think the news industry has always been competitive. But now it's competing with each other to the detriment because the biggest competition is Silicon Valley. So when we really think about this revolution, I completely agree with you, there is not the business model to sustain all these different voices. And to a certain extent, I don't think we necessarily need all of the voices that we have. But my concern is if we don't think about this strategically, we're going to lose some really important independent voices who are holding you know, power to account. So yeah, that's one of my biggest concerns. 
That, that's very interesting because it's against the idea <coughs> that what is happening is a threat to, uh, to established media organizations. So this takes us to the next point. Uh, Mr. Aaron, uh, the, one would have thought that with everything that is happening, all of these, uh, th this competition is basically bad for the established news organizations. But the idea that Dr. Claire has just said is that she thinks that there will be more consolidation. So how do you see that playing out, basically? You know, the, the idea, and your excellencies have mentioned this, Claire has, has, has brought it to our attention. Is there a revolution? Some people are still asking that question, but the reality is the revolution you know, it's been hashtagged, it's been geotagged, it's been snapped, right? We're in the revolution, it's happening. Technology is, is the fuel, but it's not really the fire. I think the fire is this idea that all media organizations have to be smarter. They need to know not only when people are consuming content, but they want to know why people are consuming that content. I believe that part of these many revolutions, it's not just one, there's many revolutions, is that as we share media and as I consume media from people that I trust, there's a branding that goes on with the media that I read. If you read Quartz in the morning, that says something about you now, Your Excellency. If I'm an LA Times reader, or if I'm that person that says, I heard a story on National Public Radio, if I'm sharing a CNN story, I'm now saying a lot about myself and I'm sharing their content. I think it's an opportunity for news organizations to come back and earn our trust. Because it cannot, we cannot afford it to be a luxury item to have accredited, trusted, verified, and validated information. We can't afford that. But news organizations will have to earn our trust in the future because I am sharing their information. When I'm sharing their information, I'm sending a message to the people on my social media feeds about what I think my relationship is with that media organization. So in some ways, we've become tighter in our relationship. There's more media than ever, but I have to be more careful, or I should be more careful, about whom I align myself with as a media organization. I think those are some of the challenges in front. Now, basically, the issue of uh, trustworthiness and credibility is all on the line right now with uh, the, the recent, uh, um, let's say, the, the inability, <laughs> the inability of the media <laughs> to basically either report or detect what has been going on either in the UK or the US. But we will get to that. First, uh, I just want to go back to the idea of citizen journalism because all of you mentioned it in a way. Um, uh, Mrs. Mona, do you think that, uh, what is your, uh, your idea on citizen journalism? Do you think that you know, I they are taking over, basically? Do you believe in that term? Uh, I don't know. I don't want to say that they're taking over because I'm coming from the media industry and I still want <laughs> to see media outlets taking the lead with whatever is going on. But the reality is they are taking over. And we have to understand that breaking news, especially video streaming, it's accessible now. Anyone can uh, video stream, you know, on Snapchat or uh, Twitter uh, live stories, uh, you know, st uh, stories or uh, uh, Facebook Live. So there are ways. Even social media are doing this. So people, each one of us, is a journalist. I'm sorry, journalist. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and they have access to all information. I think this would really be a great opportunity, and I said that today in the council, of really create um, an emerging between social media and media outlets. This emerging or this coexist between the two uh, when it comes to um, life breaking news on ground or, uh, you know, uh, while it comes, uh, it's coming from an incredible outsource like New York Times or the Washington Post. When I compare a story of, um, let's say, an investigation that, is, uh, that took place in uh, Washington Post and cost thousands of dollars, months of preparations, and compare it to uh, a post by a celebrity, you know, that has the highest likes, and nobody really, you know, care about that story about Syria or about uh, Iraq or about uh, the economy, and they care about whatever this uh, celebrity is saying. This is uh, where I see a gap, a gap, a gap that needs to be filled, and it's already filled by the citizen, uh, you know, uh, a media citizen, uh, but at the same time, it needs to be filled by the, or supported by the media outlet. Uh, Mrs. Noura, the, the idea of journalism is, journalism usually is linked to credibility, it's linked to high quality, when you produce a piece, when you are writing uh, a piece, you 
you want to make it the best possible. You you get a, a proper you ha you quote people basically. You have your sources. You double check them. You produce high quality content, and then there's this person who comes and posts anything because he has a big follower. People accept it from him. So do you think then that this really uh, is a threat to the to journalists, or you think that it has been proved, or with time? Uh, the journalists will be able to journalist as a, uh, journalism as a career will be sustainable because of that because of the quality that they produce. I, I think journalism as a career is not. I, I'm, I'm not. I don't think it's a job that would be diminished soon. I, I believe it's a very important job, journalism, and you know, getting the news right and you know, working on on pieces of news that supports the cause or whatever the, you know, wherever the, journal, the journalist is, is, is reporting from. The question is, or the point is, how is an editor-in-chief is the head of the game? How is he or she is ahead of the game when they say influencers from a celebrity perspective, they're a singer or they're in the fashion industry, breaking news or talking about a topic and it's read more than news that we categorize as serious news. And I think before the session we had, a, I wish, I mean, to, I wish we continued, I mean, the briefing. Uh, we had a discussion about the matrix and the audience and how it's, um, currently we think that, we think that, you know, s such headline would be read by everyone uh, or perceived the same way we, we think it would be perceived. So the, so the element is being ahead of the game. There is citizen journalism. There are celebrities or there are influencers. How they will influence, this is another story, okay? The, the point or the focus is the audience. How am I reaching to my audience? And who are my audience? Um, and I feel, I feel it's, it's getting tougher and tougher in editors and chiefs and journalists because they will need to cope with the changes and what's happening around them. Because we, sometimes we say, you know, um, we, st we stopped or we, we used to see a certain newspaper that this is the first source that I would read my news from. But right now, I think they're similar in a way or another. And with the newcomers as well, I would also say that they're on the, on, on sta on the same, on, on same par. So it's where, where do we, us as an audience and a journalist, it's like, I'll just give you an example. It's just like I'm going out for a speech and I'm going to talk. So how would I, how would my speech, would I look in front of a mirror or would I record myself speaking and listening to myself and asking the question, do I make sense? And I think that that's, 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 that's also a question that we should trigger to people who are creating the content. Uh, you touched, I think, on a very important idea, which is sensationalism. Uh, I think... Uh, Sens sensationalism is basically uh, the, uh, skewing the, the media industry. You see that sensational news is taking a much bigger following. Uh, so basically, uh, news organizations, in order to make their news attractive, they are going to sensationalism at the expense of uh, being neutral and telling the story in a, in a proper way. Um, Dr. Claire, do you think that the, the people will continue to follow brands, brand names, in order to get the story, the right story, or will sensationalism take over, basically? It's a good question. I mean, one thing I think when we have these discussions is to say, we now have metrics, and those metrics allow us to know exactly what people click on. In the days of newspapers, all we would know is that somebody bought the newspaper. We didn't know whether they read it, they didn't know whether they used it to put down for their cat litter, <laughs> or we didn't know whether they just flicked through and looked at the cricket scores. Now we know exactly what people click on, and so it's easy to be depressed because we, we see amazing journalism about Syria, and we see it doesn't get very many clicks. Or worse, I used to work for the UN Refugee Agency. We would have people share our content, but they weren't reading it. They wanted to look like the types of people who cared about the refugee cause. So, so going back to sensationalism, I'm British. We've always had terrible tabloid newspapers that used imagery in really sensationalist ways, had terrible headlines, which is the same as we see today. And we have to remember we're all humans. And we all, there's elements of our human nature which perhaps we shouldn't be that proud of. But the challenge for news organizations is 
How do we ensure that we are informing people, but also recognising that people want it in a visual form, they want it to be appealing, they want it to load quickly on their mobile phone. Mm -hmm. So I think, yes, we need to be aware of things like clickbait headlines, but Facebook changed its algorithm, so those kind of stories that had, you know, you'll never guess what happened, click here, those headlines have been, you know, decreased in the algorithm. So we're learning as we go, but the changes that we've seen in the last five years are so extraordinary that we're just desperately trying to catch up and that we should be concerned about our people just clicking on these things. But we also have to rec recognize as humans, we've all, always loved gossip. So when talk, people talk about rumors and fake news, we've always kind of gossip. Have you heard about that? Have you heard about that? Even <laughs> though we weren't 100% sure about it. But we also have to have sections of our society and pillars, whether it's you know, the person in your society that you trust or, you know, so we, we have to recognize that yes, there's been change, but we're not that different to where we've always been, so we have to be aware of but it. But I think we, we shouldn't confuse between the type of audience. For example, I present business news on Al Arabiya. The audience who watches business news is not the same audience who wants to watch entertainment news, although yeah. entertainment news has a much bigger following. It's more, yeah. it's more popular. Yeah. But I am talking within the audience of people who want business news. Yeah. So how much of a competition is that person who is not a journalist, who just has a following and can post things that are basically cause a competition to me uh, and take away and not only the audience but also the, also the revenue. Now we know that these influencers, they also make money out of it. So they take revenue uh, from the media organization. Yeah, no, it's a really important point. And I think, you know, for the last seven years, I've been training journalists on how to use social media to find information, to verify that information. And I'm very early on doing a BBC training session and there was a fire. And as the fire raged, the London Fire Department was tweeting, the ambulance service was tweeting, the government was tweeting, and the journalist looked at me and said, I might as well give up because my audience now gets the same sources at the same time as me. Why do I even exist? And I said, because the job of journalism, journalism now is about verifying that those claims are true and providing context. Mm -hmm. And that's when we talk about bloggers or we talk about influence sharing anything, as the news industry, we have to make it clear our jobs still exist and they're even more important than ever. But we can't just embed tweets from Donald Trump. We need to take the, A, verify them and say, well, actually he lied because four years ago he said something different. And we have to say, why does this matter and what's the context? So you telling of the business news should be better than the influencer or the blogger. Otherwise, you shouldn't be paid. So I think it's actually putting pressure on journalists to do a better job than ever before because we do have a role and it's about verification, it's about context. And I think if we lose that, then yeah, everybody can see everything on social media. So we have to say, this is why we exist. Aaron, how, how should it be done? There is a threat, there is competition. How should it be done? Well, I think that, that Claire raises something that's so important for all of us to remember in being human because we like to do the things that she mentioned. I never gossip. <laughs> I, have an aunt, I have an aunt who says it's called helping people. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the, the idea that, that we're all humans means we love a good story. We love storytelling. And it, you, you asked the question, how should we do it? There's a couple of things missing. We're here talking about the future. And we've been convened here to talk about the future of media. There are areas, urgent areas for investment. And the most important technology in journalism is still the human being. Yeah. It's the journalist. And so while there are, are you know, millions of dollars being poured into new technology and how we share story, I hope that we as a community who cares and wants good information is investing in the ultimate technology of the journalist. And by that, you know, there's a couple of examples. You, you raised the point about uh, some of the things that we've seen in the headlines this week. I'm sure we'll talk about them. But in the United States, there's only, there, there are 21 states out of 50 states who have the need for who don't have a journalist, both in the hometown and the capital city. What does that say about accountability in journalism in the United States? If you don't have a journalist asking a political leader a question, both in the hometown and in the capital city, they're not accountable to be the same person in both places. We need investments in journalists. We know that we need investments in training journalists on issues like sustainability. We at the UN Foundation have found that people want to consume news that's about evidence, good storytelling, and about solutions. Solutions on things like the issues, the urgent issue of refugees, hunger, poverty, how, how, to, how to get clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy. We know that people want those stories, but you have to invest in journalists in order to get those stories 
to be a part of what, of, of, what, of what they know about things they're comfortable with. So I think that how we do it in a high-tech world comes down to a rather low-tech thing, a low-tech reality, a low-tech solution, which is making sure that people are first, that we, de that we develop them with, with investments, and then we make sure that we're, we're concentrating on you know, heartbeats as much as gigabytes, if that makes sense, you know, people who make up the journalist core as well. Um, Mrs. Nouria, the, today you are a chairwoman of, a, of a, the media zone and basically it's uh, in everybody's interest that these uh, corporations can sustain their edge. So basically, how do you think uh, they should invest for the future? And um, basically we saw so many stages in the media. First there were the traditional media organizations, then came along the digital media organizations such as the Huffington Post and uh, the beast, and even those now are facing competition. So what should be done to invest to the fu for the future? Um, I mean, looking at the Media Hub, which is basically in 254, we facilitate services to more than 400 companies. Um, and, you know, just also guaranteeing sustainability of what we do as an organization and those companies as well is important for us because the success of those companies is our success, and, and this is how we, we, like, we like to look at it. Going to the going to the point of sustainable sustainability of media and how it can be commercially viable, I believe this is a challenge in the region, um, not just in in, uh, in the UAE but in the region. And the reason why is going back to journalism and the journalists and and the training that the journalists get, um, and then also how are we are we. Um, are we being measured by the content or by the advertisers? Mm -hmm. Who is taking the decision? This is a very important question in the region. When it comes to TV or when it comes to news, who is taking the decision? Is it the audience that they're enjoying what they're watching or reading or is, are they the advertisers? And I think this, this, is, this also links to measurement matrix as also, you know, you know, Claire is talking about how Facebook are, are creating such algorithms, and I'm, I'm really happy that we will be able to maybe utilize those algorithms, even if a newspaper. So how our news and media companies can use smart algorithms that shifts from traditional media to digital for us to be able to measure it and to understand the number of clicks, the number of reads. Now, when you, when you read a story, you can read the first paragraph and then there's that read more. And I think subscribe you know, or subscribe <laughs> or read more now yeah. instead of subscribing yeah. because they want to know, are you just reading the headline or are you reading the whole article, which yes. is a very smart way as well. So how can we adapt in terms of how we measure the way that our audience are reading the news and then with the right matrix and algorithms that sh and shift away from print, sorry, I'm, I'm not saying we have to kill print, but if I want to guarantee, if, if I want to guarantee my newspaper, I would transform it to digital and with the right algorithms and with the right focused and targeted, engaged content that, you know, that, you know, we can't cover all the news. Mm. We can't get, you know, 100 people covering what's happening in D.C. with the election because they will know it from, you know, the sources in D.C. or they will know it from the... We, we, it's, it's also, the, it's, it's the story has to be different and, and measuring that story is so important. Um, Mrs. Muna, the, the, the problem is with this fragmentation and this causes a problem for on the revenue side. Now, organizations have to monetize uh, their offering. So what is happening is that basically they, they are putting their news on these multi-platforms and then the, the revenue is fragmented as well. So what is the model for the future, basically? How can they invest in a way uh, where they can monetize these, these, uh, um, these different platforms and the methods of distribution? Yes. I think first, going back to Noor's point, um, I'd like to, to elaborate on this because here in Dubai, we've created a, a nice system when His Highness Sheikh Mohammed announced the Dubai Media City and Dubai Internet City back in 2000, 16 years back. And today we have two, uh, two sectors next to each other, supporting each other. Like you have technology and you have media. And this is, it's all about it. I mean, when you 
put them together, then you will come up with innovative ideas or innovative projects that would be sustainable. So I think companies like our um, media cities would sustain and uh, tenants within, within such uh, entities will also continue to support each other. So the idea of technology and, uh, and media always bring innovation to the, to, the, to the platform. And I believe that um, even if we, uh, the, the media outlets today should think of that, innovation is the way to change. And we talk about today, I know how much advertisers are concerned about the digital media and how much it is difficult to generate revenues when it's come to digital media, especially uh, our media outlets here in the, in the region. Yet, I think the future is about innovation ideas you have to come up with innovative uh, content rather than just a normal content. You compete today with, um, with individuals. You don't compete with influencers. There is an influencer who gets maybe an ad much higher than a media outlet just because she or he posts this picture on her Instagram or Facebook and revenues affects. Just to tell you, you know, that uh, I think by subscriptions in the, in the, U, uh, in the US, it's a, uh, it's a PwC um, uh, study, for uh, $420 billion uh, dollars, uh, is advertising by subs subscriptions. So wow. again, how much this will influence the future of media and talking about the media and the region and how much this will affect the platforms to to become more developed, to become more creative in their content and sell more innovative ideas rather than just content. Uh, Dr. Claire, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, uh, on the idea of monetizing uh, um, basically this, this, uh, these multiple platforms of distribution of news. So one of the reasons that the news industry is in trouble is because it failed to innovate around advertising. So it kept believing that people would come to their homepage, homepages covered in advertisements that spent a long time loading, and Facebook kept saying, that is a terrible experience for our users, that is a terrible experience for our users. But the news industry failed to do anything, so Facebook said, we'll build instant articles, which means they load very, very quickly, and we will keep people in the Facebook ecosystem. And the news industry said, that's not fair. But if you go to a news website with pre-roll ads against video and horrible, no wonder that the news industry is dying. So in terms of where are we going and how do we make this sustainable, we have to innovate around advertising or we have to come up with other models, which you know, I think there will be a huge spike in subscriptions and memberships, but we have to give people uh, an incredible experience if we expect them to hand over money because they've now expected information for free. Yeah. So that's part of the problem here is that we didn't move quickly enough. And Facebook is going to come up with more ways that publishers can monetize. At the moment, you can take 100% of revenue from an instant article, but again, we're not moving quickly enough. And the industry isn't collaborating with each other, it's still competing with each other, and Silicon Valley is walking away with all the dollars. So in order for it to be sustainable, we have to think strategically about this, and we have to innovate. And the fact that we still rely on banner advertising is not the answer. That's not, and the reason that ad blockers, you gave that statistic at the beginning, People are turning on ad blockers because the experience is a horrible one. So we have to stop force feeding this to users because they're going elsewhere. So I don't have the answers, but it's not working right now. Uh, advertising is a function of how much impact a, a news organization has. So um, I also want to ask you about this. The, the, the news organizations have always been dominant and they, they made impact and they shape public opinion. Um, today, it seems that their impact is much less. Taking it now to the recent U.S. elections, we know that major publications, major television networks endorsed uh, Hillary Clinton, yet the impact wasn't there. So um, how do you see this going forward? Do you think that news organizations are going to lose more uh, in terms of impact and ability to shape public opinion? So the numbers I saw was that 57 newspapers endorsed Hillary Clinton, two endorsed Donald Trump. I yeah. don't know who they were. Um, but so the question is, was it that the 59 million people who voted for Donald Trump were watching CNN and were reading the New York Times and decided not to agree with them? Or, and I think this is more the case, they're nowhere near CNN and New York Times. They're on Fox News, they're on Breitbart, they're on right-wing blogger sites. So the problem when we think about civic discourse is that we have a, in the US a very polarized population who are living very much in communities where people believe and think the same ways, they're reading the same information, but it's very different. 
And that's what worries me, is how do we come back from this when the country is incredibly polarized? So I think it's less that the news organization didn't have influence. I think because of social networks like Facebook, you can spend time receiving information from other spaces that are not the traditional gatekeeper spaces. Fewer people sit down at 7 o'clock and, and watch a news bulletin. They are spending more time in their bubbles. Yep. And that's, that's what I'm really, really concerned about. Aaron, is it this, the, the, the living in a bubble, is it that when you are on social media, it's these built-in algorithms that keep on pushing your way the same type of news that you consume, and you end up not knowing what's going on in other places because you're not reading the stories, you're not watching that news, so you miss out on important stories that are going on? Is this one theory, or is it the theory? Because there are so many questions now of what went wrong. Yeah, and I think we're going to be studying the results of the election not only in terms of who took over the White House, but what, it, what took over our news and our consumption. I think that was, this election in many ways is, has been a referendum for people, but it's also been, and, and political office, but it's also been a wake-up call for people about how we do consume information and how we share it. You pose a question, and Claire rightly said that we saw that there are these, these polarizing um, uh, these polls of information or of, or of, or of uh, data that's shared back and forth with people, I think it also comes back to personal responsibility. So I, as a news consumer, need to be asking myself very carefully, and this comes with education, training, and innovation. This may be one of the most innovative things we can talk about here in Dubai at this meeting, is how are we supporting consumers to be literate, to know more, to be digitally literate about the sources that they're reading, where it came from, what was an ad versus what was an article, how, and then to know more about the different, the different outlets or journalists that, that brought them their story. So there's something that's, we can't take away personal responsibility here. Human beings must be responsible for the information that they consume and even more responsible for the information that they share. But to, to this other point about the, the filter bubble, I was telling a story, I'll repeat the story I, I, I shared earlier. I switched phones with a teenager that I know in my church group right before the election. And I thought we were very close politically. And I said, hey, let's, let's trade phones for a minute. He looked at my Facebook feed and, and I looked at his, you know, his, his, his feeds that he had. You know, he, of course, mocked me because I'm old. <laughs> but I was amazed how the information that he was getting was so different. It was like we lived in two different Americas. Mm -hmm. Now, that is good from a diversity standpoint, mm -hmm. but only if we're sharing and only if we're conscious of it. So who helps innovate this? I think we need to make a call to philanthropy. Philanthropy has a role when a sector is innovating. Academia has a role when a sector is innovating. The practitioners themselves have a role when a sector like media is innovating. And I think we need to call on all of these actors to come together and help us figure it out. Help us figure out ways for us to build bridges instead of building bulwarks I where we're separated I, from one I another. I think, and just to add to your point, I think also entertainment should yes. be really involved. Mm -hmm. you know, Sorry, I didn't hear entertainment. that. Entertainment. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we, we tend to think oh, those sectors will support it in a way, but also the message out there. So I'll just give you an example. You know, so if you go to a Comic Con, uh, you know, a Japanese uh, comic uh, exhibition, or what you call the Korean wave that is happening, and the celebrities and the, the singers and the makeup and everything, you think that you have a small portion of your society watching the drama, but just make it happen. Just, you know, just trigger those events or, or talks or exchange, the moment you trigger that, you're going to you know, uh, look at a different kind of audience that reads the news differently and enjoys content in a different way and, learn, and is learning a different language. You um, tap into a new audience. You basically. tap into a new audience and even in the future of what we do and I think what, we, what we've been doing here in the government, um, the new uh, future government of the UAE, that is Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, made sure that it's a, also a government that talks to the future of having a youth minister mm. who, who is at 22 years old. So when a 22 years old talk to a 24 years old or a 19 or a 15, it's different when a 30 plus years old or a 40 plus years old talk to them. So this is how we're getting our messages differently, even in yeah. entities. Nora, I think interesting just to mention this uh, about the youth uh, council, the UAE Cou Youth Council. I attended last month uh, the UAE Youth Council retreat, and it was interesting how those young professionals and young students, you know, 
I ask a question. Uh, the question was, um, what media do you, do you watch or read? You know, and they say, we don't follow any, any traditional media anymore. And I'm talking about the future of this country, you know, and they are the majority. We're talking about a, percent, a high percentage in the region, and we're talking about a high percentage in the world that would change the, uh, the platforms of the media industry. So youth should be involved in all our discussions when it comes to the future of media or the future of education or the future of health. Uh, probably they are not watching it in the traditional way of switching on a television or reading a newspaper. But here's another element. They might be getting the same content, but on different platforms. So this is actually also a, a question mark that one has to study. But Aaron, going back to what you were saying, uh, <laughs> This could be one aspect that basically you are living in a bubble, you get the same type of news, so basically you miss out on other stories. But now, within the self uh, soul searching that has been going on in the past two, three days, there's another theory that basically the, the press was not neutral, that they wanted one candidate to win, that instead of telling the story, they focused on the personal failures of the second candidate, on his personal failures, on his character, instead of reporting the story of probably his messaging. And maybe then they would have noticed the anger and the, they, they would have noticed the, the, the real story, which is why people voted for change. So what do you think about that? This takes us to neutrality of news or the bias when rep reporting the news. Is it supposed to be neutral? Or <laughs> is it supposed to give me an objective helpful look at something. So I think this might not make me any new friends, uh, but I believe that I count on the news organizations that I follow and that I share, and I try to, to listen to multiple news organizations because they're gonna give me a full picture. I know they're coming at it from a point of view, and when I read editorials, I definitely know where their point of view is. I want my media partners, because I view them as partners, to be active in society. So I want them to have an, object, an, an objective view about what's going on in society so that I can make my own decisions. However, there, there, there are whole sectors and institutes that work on this issue. I think one of the, the questions that we need to ask ourselves in this soul searching that, that happens in the next, uh, you know, as, as we look back on, on, on what's going on is, at what point are we stewards of the information that we're putting out and also the information that we're storing. I'm really interested to find out as we look back how much of the information exchange that happened between news and social media, how much is available for us to look back on anymore. And I hope that what we do is that we have this, the, a, a hard look at data and who owns the data about what happened in this election and who owns the data about what happens in any future election. I think that requires a very big conversation right now so that we can find out what was shared publicly, what was available publicly and not. Uh, I want my news organizations to be in the world so that they can give me that context. I'm not looking for a news organization to be in a vacuum. Okay, can I just uh, say something very quickly? Yes, please. There's a platform called Harkin in America with the whole principle is that you ask your audiences first what do they want the stories written about and then the journalists write about them. And I think when we talk about revolutions, Journalists and editors and news organizations have had this, this idea that we know best and we will tell our readers what mm -hmm. they need to know. And actually, social media now allows people to talk amongst themselves. And there was this perception the media were ignoring whole swathes of the US population that were angry and hurt and felt that they were being ignored. And if more news organizations had started with that premise is, what does our audiences want to investigate? then I think we probably would have got to this earlier. So I think this, this election will cause a real rethinking of the news, and I think that model of the gatekeeper telling us what a we bottom, should know. You, you want a bottom-up approach rather than the top-down approach that I think has been one from the editor to the people. I think it's a mixture of both, and I think it's been too top-down, yeah. and we're not, we haven't been listening to audiences. At least we should be, that's the beauty of technology. If we're looking toward the future, toward 2030, and here in the UA it seems like we're always looking toward way beyond 2030. <laughs> and if we've been challenged to look that way, at least we should be using technology to do both. Yeah. This idea that, um, I don't remember uh, who cited it first with the idea that we have two ears and one mouth, and we should be using it in proportion. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe there's a reminder for media, as well as for for communicators or marketers or others, we've got to listen. And in America, people were not listening enough. 
On that note, we will end this session, although it's a very exciting discussion. We could have gone on and on, but our time is up. So thank you very much for your contribution, and thank you for bearing with us. Thank I hope you. you enjoyed the discussion. Thank, thank you. you.